Welcome to Trinity Lutheran Church's Holy Thursday Liturgy. We begin this service with a moment of silence. Psalm 116 What shall I render to the Lord for all his bounty to me? I will lift up the cup of salvation and call on the name of the Lord. I will pay my vows to the Lord in the presence of all his people. Precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints. O Lord, I am thy servant. I am thy servant, the son of thy handmaid. Thou hast loosed my bonds. I will offer to thee the sacrifice of thanksgiving and call on the name of the Lord. I will pay my vows to the Lord in the presence of all his people in the courts of the house of the Lord in your midst, O Jerusalem. Praise the Lord. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. Let us make confession to God. Almighty God, merciful Father, I, a troubled and penitent sinner, confess to you all my sins and iniquities with which I have offended you, and for which I justly deserve your punishment. But I am sorry for them, and repent of them, and pray for your boundless mercy. For the sake of the suffering and death of your Son, Jesus Christ, be gracious and merciful to me, a poor sinful being. Forgive my sins. Give me your Holy Spirit for the amendment of my sinful life, and bring me to life everlasting. Amen. Almighty God, his mercy has given his Son to die for us, and for his sake forgives us all our sins. Through his Holy Spirit, he cleanses us and gives us power to proclaim the mighty deeds of God, who called us out of darkness into the splendor of the light. As a called and ordained minister of the Church of Christ, and by his authority, I therefore declare to you the entire forgiveness of all your sins. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let us pray. Eternal God, in the sharing of a meal, your Son established a new covenant for all people, and in the washing of feet he showed us the dignity of service. Grant that by the power of your Holy Spirit, these signs of our life and faith may speak again to our hearts, feed our spirits, and refresh our bodies. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Our first reading is from the book of Exodus. The Lord said to Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt, This month shall mark for you the beginning of months. It shall be the first month of the year for you. Tell the whole congregation of Israel that on the tenth of this month they are to take a lamb for each family, a lamb for each household, if a household is too small for a whole lamb, it shall join its closest neighbor in obtaining one. The lamb shall be divided in proportion to the number of people who eat it. Your lamb shall be without blemish, a year old male. You may make take it from the sheep or from the goats. You shall keep it until the fourteenth day of this month. Then the whole assembled congregation of Israel shall slaughter it at twilight. They shall take some of the blood and put it on the door, two doorposts and the lintel of the houses in which they eat it. They shall eat the lamb that same night. They shall eat it roasted over the fire with unleavened bread and bitter herbs. Do not eat any of it raw or boiled in water, but roasted over the fire, with its head, legs, and inner organs. You shall, not, you shall let none of it remain until the morning. Anything that remains until the morning you shall burn. This is how you shall eat it, your loins girded, your sandals on your feet, and your staff in your hand. And you shall eat it hurriedly. It is the Passover of the Lord, for I will pass through the land of Egypt that night, and I will strike down every firstborn in the land of Egypt, both human beings and animals. On all the gods of Egypt I will execute judgments. I am the Lord. The blood shall be a sign for you on the houses where you live. When I see the blood I will pass over you, and no plague shall destroy you when I strike the land of Egypt. This day shall be a day of remembrance for you. You shall celebrate it as a festival to the Lord throughout your generations. You shall observe it as a perpetual ordinance. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. 
Our second reading is from St. Paul's first letter to the Church of Corinth. For I received from the Lord what I also handed on to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, took a loaf of bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body that is for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup also after supper, saying, This cup is a new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Here ends the reading. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The Holy Gospel according to St. John, the 13th chapter. Glory be to thee, O Lord. Now before the festival of Passover, Jesus knew that his hour had come to depart from this world and to go to the Father. Having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. The devil had already put it into the heart of Judas, son of Simon Iscariot, to betray him. And during supper, Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands, and that he had come from God and was going to God, got up from the table, took off his outer robe, and tied a towel around himself. Then he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet, and to wipe them with a towel that was tied around him. He came to Simon Peter, who said to him, Lord, are you going to wash my feet? Jesus answered, You do not know what I am doing, but later you will understand. Peter said to him, You will never wash my feet. Jesus answered, Unless I wash you, you have no share with me. Simon Peter said to him, Lord, not my feet only, but also my hands and my head. Jesus said to him, One who is bathed does not need to wash except for the feet, but is entirely clean. And you are clean, though not all of you. For he knew who to betray him. For this reason he said, Not all of you are clean. After he had washed their feet, he put on his robe and had returned to the table. He said to them, Do you know what I have done for you? You call me teacher and Lord, and you are right, for that is why I am. So if I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have set you an example, that you also should do as I have done to you. Very truly I tell you, servants are not greater than their master, nor are messengers greater than the one who sent them. If you know these things, you are blessed if you do them. Now the Son of Man has been glorified, and God has been glorified in him. If God has been glorified in him, God will also glorify him in himself and will glorify him at once. Little children, I am with you only a little longer. You will look for me, and as I said to the Jews, so now I say to you, where I am going, you cannot come. I give you a new commandment, that you love one another, just as I have loved you. You also should love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples, if you have love for one another. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise be to thee, O Christ. Grace be unto you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Back in the late 1960s and early 70s, my father would occasionally stop the trusty old station wagon at the Dunkin' Donuts shop on Haddon Avenue between Hannafield and Westmont on the way home from church. We would leave the store with a box of donuts. There were no drive throughs yet. And that, would use, that box would usually be covered with smiley face decals. Back then, the smiley face was everywhere. There were stickers, buttons, t-shirts, you name it, Smiley was on it. After over 50 years, Smiley is still around. Of course, what makes Smiley interesting from a historical point of view is the confusing history behind his creation. There's at least three different stories, or three different people or groups, who claim to be the creator or owner of Smiley. My favorite explanation of Smiley's creation we know is not one that is true, but it's by far the best story. The 1994 Robert Zemeckis film, Forrest Gump. Forrest stumbles into the history books as he runs across the country. At one point, he meets a poor t-shirt salesman who Gump recalls wanted to put my face on a t-shirt, but he couldn't draw that well and he didn't have a camera. As luck would have it, a truck flies, drives by and splashes Gump's face with mud. He wipes his face on a yellow t-shirt and hands it back to the down-on-his-luck entrepreneur, telling him, have a nice day. The imprint of Gump's face left a perfect abstract smiling face on the bright yellow t-shirt, and thus an icon was born. In 2,000 years, hundreds of thousands of images of Jesus have been created, but all by artists who lived long after Jesus' time. There were no cameras in the first century, and Jesus called fishermen and tax collectors to follow him, but no artists. All we have are artistic impressions of what Jesus may have looked like, and usually these impressions 
reveal more about the artist and the worldview the artist lived in than an actual representation of the real Jesus. Don't you ever wonder what Jesus truly looked like? A laughing, short-bearded Jesus with dirty blonde hair and blue eyes? You know, the image I called the surfer dude Jesus in a previous sermon? What about an African Jesus? Or a clean-shaven Jesus, arms outstretched the Last Supper? Or an Asian Jesus with his Asian mother at his side? Take your pick. Picture the face of Jesus in your imagination. And what do you see? Does he have an aquiline nose? Hair the color of walnut wood, parted in the middle, hanging straight to the ears, maybe turning to waves down to his shoulders? Does he have a dark beard behind dark eyes, tanned olive skin, high cheekbones, a narrow, handsome face filled with passion and kindness, and in his dark eyes, fire and compassion? Is this how you picture him? Is this his true likeness? Many centuries ago, an icon of Jesus was painted with these very familiar features. It's called the Mandelian icon, from the Greek meaning the Tau. Orthodox Christian traditions claims the icon was the first painting of Jesus. It is believed to be an accurate representation of the true Jesus, or his true likeness. And here we have a picture. That's the Mandelian Jesus, believed to be the oldest picture or representation of Jesus put down in art. In the writings of the Anti-Nicene Fathers, there is a story of how the Mandelian icon came to be. The fame of Jesus, the wonder worker and healer, had spread far beyond the lands of Judea, where he taught and worked and walked. Across the Euphrates River in the city of Edessa, believed to be the modern southeastern Anatolian city of Saliophora in Turkey, lived a governor named Abgaris, who suffered with an incredible disease that neither herbs nor doctors could heal. Hearing of Jesus' miracles, Abgaris wrote to him in a letter, as recorded by Eusebius, the bishop of Caesarea in Palestine, who flourished in the early part of the 4th century. For their genuineness, he appeals to the public registers and records of the city of Edessa in Mesopotamia, where Abgaris reigned, and where he affirms that he found them written in the Syriac language. He published a Greek translation of them in his ecclesiastical history. To Jesus called to Christ, Abgaris, the governor of the country of Edessenes, an unworthy slave. The multitude of wonders done by you has been heard of by me, that you heal the blind, the lame, and the paralytic, and cure all the demoniacs. And on this account I entreat your goodness to come even to us, and escape from the plottings of the wicked authorities who hate you. My city is small, but large enough for both of us. Abgaris convinced Ananias to deliver the letter, and while in Judea, to take an accurate account of Jesus, his appearance, his stature, his hair, his words. Ananias delivered the letter to Jesus, then stared at Jesus, trying to fix in his mind the face of Christ. Try though as he did, Ananias could mem couldn't memorize the countenance of Jesus. Jesus, knowing Ananias' heart, asked the disciple for a wash towel. A wet cloth was handed to him. He wiped his face with the towel, then gave it to Ananias. On the towel was the very image of the face of Christ. A miracle. Take this towel to Abgaris, said Jesus, and tell him I cannot come, for I must fulfill my destiny here. But later I will send my disciple Thaddeus to heal him. And Ananias fell to the ground to worship Jesus. Then returned Abgaris and Edessa, who was, who, was head, who was healed by means of the miraculous towel long before Thaddeus arrived. Do you now see my fascination with Forrest Gump and his smiley face? Sounds familiar, doesn't it? Orthodox tradition claims that it was from this Tal of Edessa that the first ancient icon of Jesus, the Mandelian icon, was later painted, which became a prototype for the faces of Jesus down through the centuries. Since the time when Ananias delivered the Tal of Edessa, thousands of icons, Western-style paintings and sculptures have been created with Jesus as a subject. In 2002, more than 100 paintings and icons of Jesus were collected for one show, the Gallery of the American Bible Society in New York City hosts an art exhibit entitled Icons or Portraits, Images of Jesus and Mary from the Collection of Michael Hall. This collection investigates the image or true likeness of Jesus in art over time. From the symbolic images of early Christian catacombs to modern interpretations, iconic as well as narrative images have served as objects of education, edification, devotion, and aesthetic appreciation. These collected works illustrate how artists, especially in the Renaissance and post-Renaissance periods, 
tended to use an established prototype for the portrayal of Christ. Whether he is part of a story or an isolated figure, Jesus is recognized by virtue of his recurring facial features. Differences and variables, obvious over time and style changes, only contribute to the, to the emphasizing a certain family error. Scripture teaches us that, teaches that we are made in God's image, but often enough we remake Jesus as a reflection of our own image, projecting ourselves onto him. It isn't just his features we may imagine, at times we reimagine and misunderstand his character too. We aren't the only ones who do this. His true likeness, his character, has always been difficult to capture, even for those who knew him personally. When Jesus was with his friends, teaching, laughing, drinking wine, and eating bread, visible, touchable, and knowable, even then he was rarely seen or understood for who he was. On the day of the big festival when Jesus rode into Jerusalem on the back of a donkey, everyone present seemed to misunderstand who he was and where he was headed. Thus began a week in which the world, finally gaining a true likeness of him, finally understanding him to a certain degree, decided they didn't like what they saw, preferring to put him away permanently. The adoring crowd expected a conquering king who would resolve Israel's ancient greatness, throwing off the weight of Roman servitude. What they got was a humble servant savior. The religious authorities thought he was a dangerous, riot-rousing rebel who'd lead the people astray. Little did they know that by killing him, he would become far more powerful, leading generations to God. So what is the character and true likeness of Jesus? The Gospel of John shows the image of Jesus in another towel. St. John writes, Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands, and that he had come from God and was going back to God, rose from supper. He laid aside his outer garments, and taking a towel, he tied it around his waist. Then he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with a towel that was wrapped around him. The true image of Jesus is in the towel that he used to wash the feet of his disciples. For in that towel we see the true nature of Jesus, to love, care, serve, and offer himself for us as a sign of how we are to care and treat each other in his name. Artists may create images of Jesus that often include our features, but the role of a disciple is to make ourselves look like Jesus and how we love, care, serve, and offer ourselves for each other. Get the picture? Amen. And now with the peace of God which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Amen. Now we'll have special music by Bob Kramer and Harry Avell. What wondrous love is this? <laughs> Thank you. 
Merciful Father, we offer with joy and thanksgiving what you have first given us, ourselves, our time, and our possessions, signs of your gracious love. Receive them for the sake of him who offered himself for us, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us pray for the whole people of God in Christ Jesus and for all people according to their needs. For the church, strengthened in word and sacrament, that it would follow Christ's life of loving service and self-giving sacrifice. For the world shaken by terror and violence, that its leaders and all people would be set free to love and serve one another with peace and justice. For everyone overshadowed by fear and anxiety, that through the ministry of the church they would find light in their darkness and protection in their trials. God of compassion, come to the aid of those in need, especially the unemployed and those who seek meaningful work, so that all might serve you in their vocations. Give strength and healing to all those who have the coronavirus. Drive out the virus and heal all parts of the body that are infected. God and protect doctors, nurses, and all hospital staff as they treat the infected. Comfort the dying and those who stand by them. Give life to those who are working with the public, to go for employees, delivery people, gas station attendants, cashiers, store clerks, utility workers, police officers, postal employees, waiters and waitresses. Strengthen and protect them as they continue to provide essential services to us. Give continued guidance to President Biden and his advisors during these difficult times. We continue to pray for the safety of troops who are deployed throughout the world, especially those who are known to us, Andre Flamini and Jordan Wilson. For those who are hungry and poor and sick, that they may not grow weary or lose heart, but trust that their lives are embraced by the cross of Christ. We ask your healing power on those who are ill, as we name them now in our hearts and before you. For anyone having trouble with bones or blood, in the name of Jesus I come against the root and cells that are affected, commanding every cancer cell to die in the bone marrow to produce pure, healthy blood. Lord, restore the affected organs and tissues and multiply the defensive, good cells to overcome all the problem cells and areas. For the faithful departed, with whom we are united in the communion of saints, that our voices may join theirs in the unending song of heaven. In your hands, O Lord, we commend all for whom we pray, trusting in your mercy through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. And now may the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Go in peace and serve the Lord. Thanks be to God. Amen.